want you at the beginning of this to picture a game in your head, your favorite game. It's the one that you would play if you could do something else right now besides just listening to me talk. So have that in your head as I begin this. For me, gaming started a long time ago. I have a gaming hero. It's not the guy who mentioned the Nintendo, and it's not some obscure indie developer you've never heard of. My gaming hero was Robert Bruno. He was a middle-aged Italian guy. Supposedly, he taught high school math. But for me, it was just playtime. He saw what made students tick and then played right in, into that. For me, he noticed that I would get bored in, in class because I would finish my work quickly. So his solution to this was to give me an additional book of trigonometry proofs with no hints in the back. Unlocking bonus content, right? Totally one of those things that you would uh, love to have in the classroom. But he also could see where students struggled and would help them with that. He posted leaderboards to have those kids who were motivated by those sorts of competitive natures to sort of jockey for a first position. And he made subjects like finite math an opportunity for real mastery. So part of the problem in talking about uh, gamifying education is how we've defined it in the past. I think historically we've been taught to think of uh, gamifying education as games that are on a computer, Oregon Trail, Read a Rabbit, or something that's on a leap pad. But instead, today what I want to talk about is how do games, how we design games, how we think about games, play into what can help benefit education. One of the things that games offer us is adaptation. Um, if I play Halo, I can choose the different modes that I can play on. I can choose easy, medium, heroic, or even legendary status. And the game's engine then makes that game more or less difficult depending on what I'm asking it to do. How does this translate to education? If I'm a kid who just loves to read, I eat Russian literature for, for breakfast, where is my legendary status? Where is my, my super difficult mode? Technology affords us some of these choices. Um, there's, there's a company called uh, Newton, uh, spelled with a K, and they offer customized playlists for, for students. It's based off of students' uh, uh, history and, and, and upon uh, data points, and it, it's a, sort of a monumental task following uh, Clayton Christensen's theory of disruptive innovation. They've specifically targeted markets that at first have been ignored. Markets like test preparation and markets like uh, juvenile detention education. Uh, furthermore, in a game, you can be totally personalized. Um, in real life, face to face, I'm a mild-mannered father of two, but in a game I can be whoever I want. I can, I can take on an entirely new persona with an entirely unique avatar that's, uh, that's very different from my my real life. Um, in a game called Minecraft, you create the whole world around you. The, the villages, the, the, all, all the objects inside are, are, are all things that you make. You make the game. In education, we can encourage a sort of uh, student making their own world by using simple tools like digital portfolios. Uh, a digital portfolio is a collection of all the things that a student has made and, and done over the years. And these, these simple websites can be made with um, editors that are, are very uh, user-friendly nowadays, things that weren't even possible five or six years ago. And uh, a lot of these tools are free. Things like uh, Google Sites and Evernote can, can help create uh, a digital portfolio for a student that fully shows off their personality and what they've done. Furthermore, as a student progresses through the years, they can be evaluated holistically, and they can be seen as for, for all the things they've done and not just for a single test over a short period of time where they struggled. Games also offer us uh, opportunities for cooperation and, and competition. Uh, I would say a good example of a game that's uh, very competitive is Words with Friends. It quickly becomes Words with Enemies. Uh, people, when they start playing it, uh, start to lose all their manners and at dinner time will just start checking their phone uh, every two seconds. Competition is a powerful motivator for us to succeed and for us to do well. There are also uh, cooperative games. Um, talk about games like World of Warcraft where you, where you build guilds and go on re raids 
uh, together uh, games like The Sims that are all about social interaction. And uh, there's a newer game called Space Team, which is a, like a, a live uh, in-person networking game where you um, try to safely navigate a spaceship, but you're all on a team together and you have to be in the same place and you're shouting at each other. It's, it's very exciting. <laughs> games like these create passion, right? I mean, when you talk about Warcraft, you can't help but think of people who become very obsessed with Warcraft. It's spawned little micro-economies. It's, it's spawned uh, a theme park in China and, and even Warcraft-based uh, weddings and, and, and marriages. Uh, cooperation and competition don't appeal to everyone all the time. Some people very much trend towards one or the other, but most of us are sort of in the middle. Um, there, in education, there was a, uh, a university professor who, instead of giving normal grades, instead distributed experience points for completing tasks uh, in, in, in his courses. And so students would then compete to get the most experience points and be like a, a level, tw level 20 student. Um, but on the, on the cooperative side, uh, there are companies, uh, educational startups, that are trying to tackle these, the social and, and cooperative end of this. There's a company called Edmodo, which is sort of like a Facebook clone for students and for teachers, which is a safe social network. You don't have to worry about your mom or other friends being on there. Um, it's just for, for learning in the classroom, but you can do all the same sorts of collaboration and uh, networking things you could do with, with Facebook. Now, these, these, uh, these game design challenges present new challenges for students and teachers. Teachers must step into the challenge of Knowing, really knowing their students and knowing what works best for them and balancing the challenges so that things that work for some students can also work for others and, 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 and marrying those two things together. But students themselves also need to take responsibility for their own learning and understand what kind of learner am I? What makes me tick? What makes me motivated? Um, um, all this leads towards talking about competence, which Fred so eloquently talked about today. Uh, you know, with, with Mario, I can bring him along, along a level and fall down a hole. I can't tell you how many times I've done that. And I have to restart over again and restart over again. And until I reach that flagpole, I can just keep going again and again and again. But uh, for students, oftentimes, we rush them along. We say, you're, you're part of this 30-person class, and you've got to go, 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 go. And it, it's, it's not a model that's that's good for students, and it's not a, a model that builds mastery and uh, comprehension. There are schools now that are taking this competency-based model. I'm glad to see that, that New Hampshire's taking the lead as a state. In, uh, in Michigan, there's a new school to open up called the Nexus Lansing that's uh, being co-sponsored by Central Michigan U University, and it's all about competency-based uh, learning. The students even have internships for the second half of the day. They have a long school day. I think it's from like 9 to 5, and for the second half of the day, they actually go go out and they work in the real world to, to, to gain those re real world skills that will be important in, in, the, um, in the job market. This inevitably, inevitably leads to assessment. Assessment is one of the trickier parts of education. Um, I work in this industry. It's, it's difficult. There are so many rules around assessment. Most people don't like taking these uh, state mandated tests. If you are one of those people you are in a very small minority. I was one of those kids who loved standardized tests. I'm a weirdo, I, I know. Um, but um, there are different ways that we can assess these things. Um, in a video game, when you're assessed and you, you did a good job, what do you get? You get a badge, right? You get a little, little image, a little something that says, I did this, I'm competent at this. And um, there are technologies now that open these badges to to teachers and schools and other institutions to, to issue. Um, Mozilla, who make uh, Firefox, have done this open badge system that allows you to earn and then display badges. Um, and this is an important thing, especially for, um, for informal learning institutions like, uh, like museums and uh, discovery centers, is that those are places where we can see this sort of innovation making in ways first, right? Because at those places, Things like curiosity, things like um, leadership and mentorship, those sort of soft skills that are hard to measure on a, on a standard-based test are things that we can, we can uh, champion 
and that we can really demonstrate in those informal situations and so they can issue those. The other way is I think we need to be clearer as, um, as an educational uh, background in, in, in terms of showing where these pathways lead. Oftentimes you, you hear kids being not motivated saying, well, what am I gonna use this for? If we never show where these skills lead and what they build upon, what they build to, um, then ultimately your guess is as good as mine. Uh, Khan Academy does a really good job of mapping out how you can start out with something as basic as addition or subtraction or multiplication and then moving on and on and on towards calculus. We can extend this map if we want with the help of corporate sponsors to so, sort of show how one could go from learning very basic math skills to eventually being a roboticist um, or being an engineer or being uh, a writer. These are all uh, jobs that are out there in the market that you need sort of those skills and we can build upon those skills and, and map those out. So ultimately, what does this mean on Monday, right? Today's Saturday, school starts again on Monday. Uh, am I saying that we all need to start making games all the time? That we need to uh, all get tablets or, or, or laptops to, to make this happen? No, I'm not saying that. I'm saying that we can do a lot better about thinking about education in terms of game design. That if teachers think that learning is a game, then they can make it so. And that, te and that students will re respond to that. When will we know when we're done? When will we know that uh, learning is a lot more like playing? We'll know when it stops feeling like work. Thank you.